Yeah, yeah. they're pretty, they're very dark. Nine thirty-five. We should be getting pretty much started here. The on-air sign is lit in the back of the room, so we are. I think we're live. Um, so this is Electric Circuit DE double or double twenty-one ten um, track B, summer two thousand eight, um, and I am your your lovely host, Kit Sishki. Um, you may have seen Christopher listed on there. Um, the only people that call me Christopher are people that don't know who I am, basically, and my parents. Um, other than that, everybody calls me Kit. Um, you can call me whatever makes you feel comfortable. Um, you can call me Kit. You guys are ostensibly like adults or almost. Um, and you can call me Mr. Sishki. You can call me Hey You, whatever kind of works for you. Um, I'm pretty easy on that. So. Um, <clears throat> I am a firm believer in syllabus day, so we will try to get this um, over with and get you out of here, say, maybe 10.30ish, a little early, but not a ton, because each one of these is like a day and a half. So um, let's just uh, start uh, flipping through the um, <clears throat> PowerPoint slides here and um, give you an idea of what's going to go on with the class this particular day and over, over the course of the summer. So. Um, <clears throat> today we'll look at some of these administrative details, um, basic concepts and units, and maybe a little bit. That's about as far as we'll get into the, the actual circuits today. Um, and I, it, it's unlikely that we'll look at circuits today, but um, so is li such is life. Like I said, my name is Kit Sishki. Um, most people don't know how to pronounce the name, and that's why most people call me Kit, because it's pretty hard to screw that one up. Um, I am a lecturer in the <coughs> computer engineering department here. Um, that does mean two things. Number one, that I, you shouldn't call me doctor um, because I haven't earned that title yet. I am working on it. I'm about, I got one more year of classwork and then, I don't know, um, probably two, another two, maybe three years of research and publication stuff to, uh, <coughs> to earn the doctorate. Um, and then you can call me doctor, but until now, just... You know, Mr. Suffices. Email, I am are up there. Um, for those of you, there's not a ton that don't uh, that I don't know, but um, <clears throat> send me email whenever. Uh, I'm very good about checking it. Probably somewhat addicted to it. Um, during normal business hours, which is something like say 8:30 in the morning uh, until 4 in the afternoon or thereabouts, you will get very quick replies to your emails. Um, if you send something between about 4 o'clock and, say, 9 o'clock, um, you will get very slow reaction to your email because I will be home with my family. Um, then from about 9 o'clock until eh, 11 o'clock, midnight, um, you will get, again, fairly quick re response <coughs> after the kids have gone to bed and I'm just sitting on the couch or doing whatever. Um, <coughs> so, but then, again, I sleep during normal people hours. So I will not be answering email from midnight until about 7 o'clock in the morning. So just so you're aware of that. Um, I am. I, I try to make a point that as long as I'm in my office, I'm signed into both AOL Instant Messenger and MSN Messenger. Um, you can fire me a question however you want. Um, it's kind of hard to answer circuit questions over uh, I am. I've done it before. Um, so it can be done, but it's not as easy as it could be. Um, so feel free to add me. Um, if nothing else, what you can use that is is an indica indicator that I am in my office and ready to answer questions if you wanted to walk by. Um, that office is ERC 222. Officially, I will maintain office hours immediately following class. Give me a few minutes to walk back over there, and I'll be there to answer questions for you guys from 11 until noon. But realistically, my job is to teach you guys. And so I take that to mean that as long as I'm in my office, the door is open, and you can stop by. So. Um, if you check, that I maintain an online calendar that's it's automatically updated every time I update anything in my office. So you can take a look at that, that URL that will tell you when I will be not in my office because I'm teaching something or I have some other meeting to go to. Um, so pay, take advantage of that. And um, you know I'm here for you. So please come and see me because I get lonely. 
<clears throat> um, the basic idea of what we're trying to do in this class, obviously, is to teach you something about electric circuits. Um, <clears throat> but without trying to sound too grandiose and academic, a lot of what we're trying to do here is also to just give you some um, good problem solving skills for um, electrical type problems. I mean, that's, that's really kind of what we're trying to do. And, um, but the, the basic circuit analysis techniques, the understanding of how current flows in circuits and um, voltages and the various behavior of circuit elements um, are all fundamental to getting through the rest of uh, the double E curriculum here. Um, and my ultimate goal is to not screw it up because if you were listening about two minutes ago, I said that I'm a lecturer in the computer engineering department. This is not exactly my, uh, my strongest area, but <clears throat> I am competent enough to teach it to you. And I think that um, I can, I've not gotten anybody that's come back to me and said, you really screwed me up. I'm, I'm lost and I've had to take the class three times again just so I understood it. So I think we'll get you out of here with the skills that you need to, uh, to succeed. Specific things that we'll talk about during the course. Um, we will look at various circuit elements like inductors, capacitors, resistors. Um, this course does not cover op amps. It doesn't cover transistors and other kinds of electronic components like that. Um, we look at various sources, both current and voltage, look at um, variable current sources, variable voltage sources, and some uh, basic laws that govern electric circuits like Kirchhoff's uh, current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and Ohm's law. Um, <clears throat> we'll spend an awful lot of time on DC current, DC circuit analysis. We'll start out with very simple ones and start using uh, KVL and KCL, Kirchhoff's current and voltage laws, um, to do some analysis there. And then we will move into some slightly different and, and more advanced uh, analysis techniques for the same kinds of circuits like superposition and Thevenin and Norton equivalents. Um, and then we will add in, and, and those, that aspect of the class, just doing analysis of circuits with just resistive elements is going to take, in this class, probably two and a half weeks, maybe even three weeks. Um, after that, we'll add in inductors and capacitors, um, which are nonlinear elements, which adds a, a level of difficulty and is the reason that you need to have differential equations as a prerequisite to this class. Um, because the, the solutions to the forms of the circuits that we will encounter then take the form of first and second order differential equations. Um, for the most part, I don't use the differential equation methods to solve them. You can do it that way. My feeling is that there's more to be learned from doing it the, um, in some more step-by-step -step methods. But um, the book does have some good descriptions of how to use um, differential equations to do the, the, find the solutions. You'll, you'll get the same solution either way. But. Um, so that, again, once we add in the transient stuff, the first and second order circuits, now you're looking at maybe three and a half to four of the weeks of the time that we're in this class. We'll be focused on those kinds of DC circuits. Finally, we'll move into AC circuits. Um, we'll apply a lot of the same analysis techniques that we learned in the DC circuits because you know, current, you know, Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's laws, they don't start to fail to hold just because we have alternating current. Um, the, just the analysis, the math is a little different. Um, which reminds me that it will be very important for you guys to make sure that you know now how to represent phasers on your calculator. I have a TI-86, I know how to do it in there. Um, the TI-89s are pretty reasonable. I think it's a very, um, pretty what you see is what you get kind of putting it in there. Um, the TI-83s I've run into problems with in the past that it's just been kind of hard to make sure that what you're typing in and what you get out as an answer is, is what you're supposed to be getting. So um, make sure that you know how to do that now. Um, dig out your calculator manual, check online. TI has, Texas Instruments has all of their um, calculator manuals posted, so take a look. Um, I will try to help you if, if I can. So um, let's see. So then we'll, because we'll, we'll look at phasers, we'll use phasers to analyze AC circuits. Um, then we'll look at power in AC circuits, which takes a, ver a, a good long time. 
um, and will prepare you if you're thinking at all about power as a, you know, um, as an option here. Um, then, depending on how much time we have left, and that's that becomes the 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 question mark at this point is whether we'll cover Laplace transforms and whether or not we'll cover resonance and Bode plots. Um, those things I try to give you at least a, a mild overview of, uh, but depending on how quickly and how slowly we're moving through the material depends on how, what depth of coverage we get on those. And talking with other instructors, the key things are the, um, the top like six bullets or whatever anyways. You'll get lots of good coverage of Laplace transforms and Bode plots and that stuff in uh, I think linear, linear circuits, linear control, something like that. Um, linear systems, whatever. Um, you'll get really good coverage of that there, um, way more in depth than we get here anyway. So, um, <coughs> One of my favorite programming books that I have um, has a story about a guy who went to the University of California, Berkeley, and he got a astrophysics degree. And then he has spent the rest of his professional life, so far at least, programming Macintosh computers. And people always ask him, dude, you have an astrophysics degree from UCAL Berkeley. Why are you, do you ever feel like you wasted your time? And he says, no, no, not at all. I, whenever I run into a problem, I think, I have an astrophysics degree from UCAL Berkeley. I'm obviously not a stupid person. This is just a hard, a hard problem. And, and that's the, the motto in that, that particular programming book, and that's the motto that I've adopt, adopted for all my classes, that this is hard and you are not stupid. Based on the, the fact that you are here at Michigan Tech, you are not a stupid individual. Um, so I think that you can do well on this material. So um, some of it is hard. And um, yeah, so, and if you have questions, please ask them. Um, I, I don't want to push through the material so fast that you're, you're feeling lost. I want to make sure that you understand it um, as we cover it. So speak up. If you don't feel comfortable speaking up in the, in the studio classroom and being put online for all people to see, um, you know, that's fine. I, I understand why you might not want to do that. So just go ahead and stop by my office. But if you can stand opening up your mouth and asking the questions, then you can um, enlighten the rest of the students as well. One of the things that you should definitely do is if you see me making some sort of idiotic math mistake or something, please let me know. Um, the summer classes that I put on last, online last year, someone asked me a question. He said, well, doesn't all of those currents, don't they sum to zero? And I was like, well, I don't remember. It has been a long time since I did that. So I downloaded the video and I was watching it and I was like, oh my gosh, what, what was I thinking? Was I awake that morning? So please, if I am making idiotic mistakes, let me know. Um, because I would rather look like an idiot for a very short period of time and be corrected than have people, people from Australia correcting me on my math um, later. So, um, The textbook that we're going to use is this Basic Engineering Circuit Analysis 9th edition. It's probably going to have to be a, uh, uh, a new book for most of you. Um, but on the upshot, you can sell it um, because it, this would be the first semester that we've adopted this particular edition of the textbook and all the people that will be taking it next year will want your textbook and you will be the only source of used textbooks. So there's a, an upshot for you. Um, the website at least used to be really full of good stuff. I think especially if you bought the textbook new, you had access to a lot of example problems, um, worked out video solutions of some of these problems, um, and so on. So it's, it's worth taking a look at that, excuse me, um, and, uh, because it is a really helpful, helpful website. One thing I would also suggest for you is this REA problem solver for electric circuits. Um, in the way of a little story, um, when, we, when I took circuits here at Michigan Tech, because I, I got my bachelor's degree here, um, <clears throat> we had three 10-week courses worth of circuits to take. And I took the first two and did reasonably well in them. And on the third, uh, the third one, I don't know what happened on the first exam, but I walked out of that exam with a 28% on that exam. And... Um, 
that was a little bit shocking, to say the least. I went to the bookstore. I bought the REA problem solvers for electric circuits. Um, I did a bunch of the problems. I studied my butt off and ended up with an AB in the class overall by virtue of the, by using that. Now again, the website that's associated with the textbook has a lot of the same kinds of things. They've got worked out problems and so on and so forth. So um, you may not need to do that, but I'll tell you what, it really saved me. And um, still, occasionally when, I'm, when I was doing the original preparation work for this course, I, I kept that book, I held on to it, and it was still helping me even like two years ago, the first time I was getting ready to, to teach this. So I think it's a really useful book, but it's up to you. I'm not gonna, certainly not going to require it. Um, <clears throat> I do use Blackboard extensively for stuff. I, you will not, almost never get a piece of paper from me aside from a quiz and an exam. Um, the syllabus is up there with all of pretty much the same information that we've been talking about so far today. Um, all of the lecture slides will be posted. One of the things that I'll do as well is after each one of these classes, I will take my notes that I write on the blue pieces of paper. I will scan them and post them as a PDF file up on Blackboard as well. Um, so <clears throat> lots of options for you there as well. As, as far as the way that I want to have it set up is for you guys as online students or as on-campus students to be able to uh, watch the videos and all of the videos will be of the the lectures will be posted on Blackboard as well. Um, so you can take a look at those. Um, I will keep all of your grades posted up there as well. Please, if I mess something up, please let me know because I haven't used Blackboard as the primary source of, of saving your grades. Um, and so occasionally there's some transcription errors that occur there. But um, And if you have some sort of problem, you know, just show me the the score and I'll fix it. Um, one, <coughs> the grade will be comprised in this class 50% out of quizzes and homework, 20% um, on the midterm exams, which is 10% each essentially, and 30% on the final exam. And there's, there are two things to, to understand about that grading scheme. The first is that um, it distributes a workload over the entire semester because half of your grade is, is determined by the quiz and homework stuff that you do. So it's not like you're going to walk into this class on three days and determine your grade. I always hated walking, you know, having a class where all I could ever do to show what my grade was and how much I understood the material was based on two exams and a final. I, I hated that. And so my personal opinion is that I want to give you lots of opportunities to get lots of good grades. But the, the, the second thing there is that you cannot do well in the class if you don't do the homework and if you don't turn it in and if you don't show up for the quizzes. So <clears throat> as much as I would like for you guys to be able to take advantage of the, the video podcasts and stuff, you do need to come to class at least to take the quizzes. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. Um, one thing to note on the grade scale, this is something that I'm going to try this term. Um, that was kind of pioneered by uh, our, the ECE department's former uh, department chair, who is now the, the dean of engineering here, um, Dr. Schultz, is he decided that in his, when he was going to teach the, the original uh, DSP class, the, I don't even remember what it is, but the, that, int that very first double E class that you have to take, um, he wasn't going to give out Ds. He said, if you don't understand the material at least a C level, then you don't get to go on. And so I think that's important enough for this one that I'm not going to give out any Ds here. Um, you have to get a 68% overall or better. But I think that's facilitated by the fact that you do get lots of quiz and homework scores to work with. Um, so yeah. <coughs> that's, that's um, all this stuff again is available on, um, on Blackboard. So you can take a look at it. Um, what the tentative exam schedule right now that I'm looking at is I would like to do, I'm, we're going to do evening exams and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the first one should be around the neighborhood of the 17th of July in the evening. Um, then we should have a second exam. I think it's about two and a half weeks later on the 4th of August. And then the final exam uh, is a regularly scheduled exam by the, 
by the, the university, and it would be the day after our last day of class, which I think makes it August 15th. I think that's the last day. So I think the last day of class is the 14th. The exam should be sometime on the 15th, as scheduled by the university. But I don't know that they've actually posted the final exam schedule yet. Um, all of these dates and times are tentative. If um, if something happens that I just don't feel like we're going to have enough material covered, I'll push the exams off one direction. Uh, I'll make them a little later. But <clears throat> um, And again, uh, these are going to be evening exams because of the summer youth program stuff. That's one of the things that um, we definitely need to make sure. I already talked about this in the email that I sent out a couple weeks ago. But I was recruited to teach summer youth programs. To, um, they, they bring up these uh, high school aged kids. Uh, to give them an introduction to engineering, try to sell them on Michigan Tech, and to especially to kind of um, take underrepresented groups um, and give them an introduction and try to get, bring them up here and increase the diversity on the campus. And um, last week I spent the whole, I spent, uh, gosh, it would be something like, well, whatever nine times an hour and a half is, I spent all of that time um, trying to convince girls that computer engineering was interesting. Teenage girls, that was, that was exciting. Um, <clears throat> the, but next week, um, we will be in here on Monday because I don't have a morning session to do. Um, but then on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we will not be here. Um, we, <clears throat> we'll try to get at least one video class uh, posted early so that you can watch that one on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Um, however you want to, and then the other two days will be made up for by the evening exams. Okay, so other than that, I don't think there are any other um, class periods that we're going to miss. Um, I know that you might like to be able to travel on the 3rd of July to get back home for, um, you know, fireworks or whatever, but um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm planning on being here and doing some teaching on the 3rd, so um, I'm going to walk out of the door here and then go home and then travel myself, but we will be in class on the, on the third. So um, There's lots of material to cover. I would really rather be out riding my bike, but um, hopefully what you will get out of this class and what you can expect from me are some clear explanations on how to do these problem solving techniques, hopefully um, why they're useful and whatnot. Um, if you a ask me questions, hopefully I should be able to answer them with a, a good degree of patience. Um, that if you send me emails, I will respond to them promptly. If you don't get a, a prompt response, that usually means that I'm um, looking at something as a, as a bigger picture. I want to answer it to the whole class or something like that. Um, to give you timely feedback, meaning that your quizzes and exams should get back to you pretty quickly, um, I think that this track, during the summer I'm usually pretty good and I can get your quizzes back to you the day at um, one to two class periods after um, you take them. And I sh that should be able to keep pretty constant at about one class period now that most of my summer commitments have been met. Um, and quizzes will show up not I, something like every other class period, which means something like once a week. Um, <clears throat> we'll see exactly how quickly they come out. Um, I don't have any preset plan in my mind for how often I will give them, but no more frequently than every other class period. And it'll be normally more like one every three class periods on average. Well, it depends on how we move through the material. Um, from the course, you'll get lots of grades. One of the things that I neglected to mention is that one of the quizzes will be dropped automatically for you. And so that means that you can either not come on one of the quiz days if you don't feel like it, or if you just have a bad day, that will automatically be wiped off of your record. Um, so um, lots of me talking. There will be some opportunities where I will do an example problem, and then I will ask you to do the same problem. And hopefully, um, and then we'll walk through it together. So there will be some opportunities for you to work on, on some problems. Um, don't expect any extra credit, though. I don't do that for the most part. Occasionally, I will um, feel like, OK, here's a few extra credit points, just if you happen to notice. Um, but it's usually, it's nothing, nothing large. And one of the reasons that I drop one of the quizzes is so that I don't have to um, deal with extra credit. So um, I've, de uh, over the years, I've uh, developed a very 
low tolerance for lame excuses and late work. So um, that's not the, don't take that to mean that I won't accept late work if you don't ha if you have a good reason. But if you don't have a good reason, I don't have a lot of sympathy for you. Um, I got pretty tired of it. The class is not particularly easy, but remember, it's hard and you are not stupid. So I think we can do pretty well. Um, and one of the other things that you won't necessarily see me do is I will try to give you basic skills for solving the homework problems that we give out, but I can't always do every single problem. Um, and I, I will be open to solving some of the, the problems um, during class if you have them, so on and so forth, but um, I'm not going to do all of them. It, it would be up to you to kind of synthesize some of the skills to come up with some of these. If you need help, um, you can all, please come to me. That's, that's why I'm here. Um, so send me an email, send me an IM, walk by my office, whatever. Um, I won't tell you where I live, but <clears throat> um, you can always work together on the homework assignments. That's fine with me if you want to kind of collaborate and say, you know, understand, to understand what's going on. Obviously, on the quizzes and the exams, you need to be able to do it by yourself. Um, what you can always try, if I'm not available or if I'm not explaining it in a way that you understand, you can always try one of the other circuits instructors. But part of the reason that I'm teaching it is because they're off doing other things. And so they may or may not be available to answer your questions. Um, hints for success, come to class. It's a lot easier to keep up with the class if you are, um, if you're coming. Ask questions if there's anything that's even remotely confusing. Do the homework. Um, I found in the past that while it's, um, it can be somewhat hard to get, uh, to keep up with the homework during the summer, that if I don't grade it, you guys don't do it. And so, um, the homework is essential for understanding the material. So um, that reminds me that um, one of the things, what we're going to do with homework is, and, and the guys that were in uh, Digital Logic last track will uh, understand what we're doing here, is that I will post, as we start to move into a chapter of the textbook, I will post the questions that you should be able to do by the time we're done. And I will give you a best estimate on when I think that this homework might be due. But I don't know for certain when it's going to be due until we've finished all of the material. So you know, the, the due dates will be kind of floating in terms of when it will actually be done. So you'll kind of have to keep up with the material in bits and pieces. And <clears throat> then what will happen, you'll turn them in, and we will, uh, and I'll grade one of the, the problems more or less randomly selected for correctness, and that will be five points. And then the other ones, I'll just look to see that you did some sort of meaningful work. Um, and as long as there's something there that looks like you actually were working on the circuit, um, that's just graded for correctness. And the other five points are the, or, sorry, completeness. And that that's composes the other five points in the, on the homework assignment. Um, for online students, we'll have to figure out a way that you're going to actually submit those homework assignments. You're probably going to get to be good buddies with the local fax machine. Um, <clears throat> so ask questions about the homework. Do it. Um, please ask questions in class. I'd be very happy to do example problems and work on the homework and give you those kinds of um, uh, hints going forward. And as, you know, again, ask questions, please. Um, do, this is one of the classes that I think that um, I might struggle a little bit more in terms of making sure that you understand everything that I'm trying to get at you and that the problem solving techniques make sense. So if you have questions, please ask. Last couple of things, especially for those of you who are going to be on the other side of the camera um, and sitting by yourself taking these quizzes on a computer or whatever, please don't cheat. Um, I've been here for almost three years now. I still don't know how to do anything by, in terms of reporting academic dishonesty, and I'd really rather not learn it. So please don't make me. Um, Final thing is that if you do have some sort of handicap or disability, uh, Michigan Tech is committed as a university and we as a faculty are committed as well to recognizing and accommodating those disabilities. However, we can't do that if you don't tell us. So if you need an extra few minutes, you know, time and a half on a quiz, time and a half on an exam or something, please, you know, supply me the appropriate documentation so that I can deal with that. So. 
that's it for course administrative stuff. Not exactly. There's one more thing, a couple more things I need to show you. Um, so <clears throat> on the, in terms of those of you who are going to both be online as well as offline, um, whether you're going to be in here or you're going to be, you know, somewhere working or whatever, um, <clears throat> all of the, the lectures are going to be recorded. The, the video will be available to you at least for the rest of the semester, if not going forward a little ways into um, into the fall semester. But it would be important for you to go to techonline.mtu.edu and take a look at the technical requirements for each one of the forms of, of sending out this information. I think that for the most part, most of us have computers that are somewhat higher than a 350 megahertz Pentium 3. Uh, so it's not exactly steep requirements, but it is important to be aware that you do need to have that, those kinds of requirements. Um, and <clears throat> some, of the, some of the aspects, like we will uh, have things set up as a, what they call a media site. And I think for media site that, that does require Windows. I'm not sure that one works without, um, works on a Mac or on a Linux machine or anything like that. I'm not positive, so don't quote me on that one. But I think you need Windows. Um, so be aware of that. Um, you do need a, a sound card and speakers, obviously, or else you won't hear much. <laughs> um, and uh, <clears throat> you probably need a reasonably fast connection to make it work. But, um, and then for those of you who are going to, it, the other thing to, to take a look with um, on the Tech Online site is for those of you who are going to be off campus, um, you need to send me proctor forms. I've gotten a couple of them, but you need to send me some more. So um, we need to, there's information here on who's an appropriate proctor, who's not, um, and for me to get information on how I'm going to distribute those exams to the offline, uh, the online students. So the other thing to to be aware of is if you do want to use iTunes to hold on to them. Um, if you go to iTunes.mtu.edu, there's two big buttons. One of them is for the if you don't happen to have iTunes, you click on the first little gray button. It, once you have iTunes installed, you click on this big yellow and black button. And that will launch iTunes, take you to the iTunes U sites. Um, within the iTunes Music Store, you can download all of those files. You can keep them forever. And you know, if you're having problems sleeping, you can always fire one up and, and go to, yeah, OK. Um, so that's it for that. Um, Okay, let's get back down here to where we're supposed to be. Okay, um, the first assignment that I'm going to give you is quiz zero, because all good computer engineers, at least, start counting at zero rather than at um, one. So the first thing that you have to do is sometime between now and the 10th of July, and I think that's next Thursday. Um, yeah, sometime between now and next Thursday, you need to stop by my office and just say hi. You know, I know most of you, um, but I don't know all of you. I want to be able to add your name to a face, and all you have to do is stop by my office and say hi. That's it. It takes about two minutes. Um, I will check you off. It's a real quiz grade. It's only five points, but it's a real grade, so stop by and do that. If the office hours don't work for you and you don't, you're not going to catch me during the other you know, 30 hours a week that I'm going to be here, um, Send me an email, make sure that I'm there. For the online students, um, you know, give, send me an email with the same kind of information in it, um, you know, where you're from, how you got here, so on and so forth. Or fire up your IM, ping me that way. Um, this is a real grade. It should be an easy A. It's pass, fail. Did you do it? Did you not? Um, so. Um, the first question that needs to be answered to some extent is, why do you need to study circuits at all? Um, it should be fairly obvious for, for most of you, because you are electrical engineers. And this is kind of the most basic uh, electrical concepts. Um, so that, that should be pretty obvious. But again, like I said at the very beginning of the class, a lot of what we're learning is a structured problem solving. Uh, technique and, and giving you a tool belt full of uh, techniques that you can use to solve problems as well as starting to give you to, to structure your thought patterns on how do I attack these, these problems as I, over, as I encounter them, especially ones that I haven't seen before. How can I do a reasonable job with that? 
Um, if you're a computer engineer, the reality is that computers are made out of circuits, and so it helps to have some sort of understanding of the circuit components that actually make up those things. And what, will, what you learn here will give you the tools to hopefully succeed in electronics. And electronics describes all of the transistors, and the transistors are what drive the logic behind the processors. And if nothing else, Michigan Tech and the Electrical Engineering Department said you had to be here, so here you are. And we'll try to have some fun with it. There ends the administrative junk. Um, we'll take about eh, 15 or 20 minutes and talk about some of the very basic electrical quantities and whatnot um, so that you can, we can get off on the right foot and make the best use of our time here. So <clears throat> the first quantity that we're going to see a lot um, is current, electric current. Um, <clears throat> it describes the flow of electrons around some sort of conductor. Um, and what's, what's kind of interesting about all of this is that um, because electrons have a negative charge on them, the flow of the electrons actually opposes the flow of the current as we will define it. So imagine that you have a closed loop of wire and the electrons are flowing around it in a clockwise fashion. We would define the current as actually flowing in a counterclockwise fashion. And it just has to do with the charges on the, on the particles. Um, for the most part, we'll just say, look, here's a, a current and it's flowing this direction in the circuit. And that will be what you need to know. Current is measured in amperes. Um, normally, we'll just talk about it as being amps as a, as a short hand notation for that. Named after a guy named Andre Marie Ampere. Um, he did a whole bunch of stuff, but as much as anything, uh, was a discoverer of some of the fundamental principles of electromagnetism. And so they decided that he was worth naming a unit after. Um, current is almost invariably assigned to a variable called I, um, I sub something, some, if you need, have multiple currents. Um, and so consequently, the square root of negative one is always given the letter J in electrical engineering instead of I. And that's, will, that will hold constant during the rest of the time that you're in electrical engineering classes. Um, so then that will show up a whole bunch more when we start looking at the uh, AC current stuff later in the semester because you can look at it either in polar form um, or you can look at it in rectangular form. And obviously rectangular form has this complex co uh, component to it and we will always talk about it in terms of J instead of I. So get ready for that. Um, one ampere uh, is a coulomb per second, which means that it's, it's defining the rate of change or, the, or exactly how kind of fast um, to some extent that the electrons are going around, the, um, around your conductor. Um, the unit abbreviation is a capital A, and you can assign whatever SI prefixes you want to it. Um, and what you'll end up hearing a lot or something like, the current was 10 milliamps or 10 microamps or whatever. The majority of things that we'll see, especially for the first few weeks of the semester here, will be things on the order of milliamps or, or milliamperes. Um, formally, a, cur a, a current is defined as the derivative of the charge. Q of T is the charge of over time. So differential of the, the charge over time gives us the current. Um, so obviously then the other, the other version of it, uh, if you integrate both sides, the integral of the current over time gives you the charge, which I think is what's on the next slide. Um, charge is actually measured in coulombs, um, and that was named after a guy named Charles Augustin de Coulomb, who also made many, many advancements to electrical theory. Um, a lot of these guys were working at about the same time, came up with a lot of the same ideas, and we, they all just got named, got their units named for different things. Um, a coulomb is an ampere per second, which comes naturally out of doing the integration. Um, a unit, the, the abbreviation itself is a capital C, um, and which is differentiated from degrees Celsius only by the presence or absence of that little degree notation. Yeah? Um, it's an ampere second. Um, so. And if I remember correctly, and, and this got a little confusing when I was writing the slides, I think that the charge is actually the SI base unit, 
but it's defined in terms of another unit, which is um, very odd. Most, most base units are defined as themselves. So Coulomb, or charge is a little weird that way. Um, one of the things that we need to get a hold on, though, is that just like vectors, so you, have you guys taken physics one with mechanics? So vectors require both a direction and a magnitude, right? So the same thing is really true with currents. We need to have both a magnitude for that current, but we also need to direct, or depict and make it very clear the direction that the current is flowing. And so we can take, a, it's, it's really simple to do that. Um, and the, the actual uh, notation is very straightforward. So if we move down to the, the overhead camera, ah. and that's going to be a pain. Um, we can have, um, it doesn't matter exactly what's doing the, the driving of this current, but if we have the loop of wire that's coming around like this, um, and you know, it, again, it doesn't matter what's driving the circuit, but if we have some sort of current that's flowing in some direction, we'll give it a little arrowhead and say, hey, here's two amps worth of current that are flowing around in a, or in a, in a clockwise manner around the circuit. Um, and that's, that's all there is to it, but those two, two aspects are required for both of them, that we need to know what direction it's flowing, but also um, the magnitude of the current. Now, we can also say, well, here comes another current. It's flowing around counterclockwise, or clockwise, but it's negative three amps. Now that's kind of funny, um, and <clears throat> we don't like to do that all of the time, if that makes sense. But sometimes you'll you'll find out that hey, the the current that as I've solved it with my math, um, it comes out to a negative current. What that practically means is that you've just defined the direction of the current improperly. And that realistically what's happening in this circuit is that you've got three amps of current that are flowing around clockwise or counterclockwise. And so these are the same thing. They describe the same current, the same magnitude. And we just need to, but and, and so that's one thing that's really important to note as you're solving these problems. Um, you may find out, oh, I got a negative current or I got a negative voltage. Oh no, it's, there's nothing to worry about there. It just means that you kind of messed up um, in determining the direction of the current or the polarity of the voltage. And it doesn't mean that you did anything wrong or that your answer is wrong. It just means that you're looking at it from a different point of view if that makes sense. So every current needs to have both a magnitude as well as a direction. That's important. Next basic um, concept is the idea that we have both alternating current as well as direct current. Um, that's pretty straightforward. You're, you understand that kind of somewhat intuitively already, but we have, um, if we were to look at the, the magnitude of the, the current over time, if it's just a nice flat line like that, that's a DC current. Um, so we've got <coughs> time on this axis, and we've got the magnitude of the current, or the, um, so <coughs> that's direct current. Direct current was popularized by Thomas Edison. He thought it was the, the way to go. And um, there are still lots of DC devices around here that you have. Anything that you have that takes a battery uses DC current. Um, and that's fine. And there's lots of good properties of DC current. But um, a guy named George Westinghouse came up with the idea of alternating current, which takes a more sinusoidal form. And I'm really rotten at drawing sinusoids. Um, but you have the same current over time takes a sinusoidal fashion or sinusoidal form that's alternating current. And there's a lot of information about the way, about the magnitude, the frequency, um, and the phase of all of this uh, current information that we'll take a look at later. Um, <clears throat> but Westinghouse thought that this was a better idea. Edison thought that this was a better idea. And Edison actually embarked on a major smear campaign against Westinghouse and alternating current, such that one of the very first electrocutions that was done, he made this huge deal out of the fact that, man, that guy died as a result of alternating current. So do you want alternating current in your homes? 
And people were like, wow, that's weird. But <coughs> um, all, obviously, alternating current one, um, for as much reason as that it's a lot easier for you to distribute it to homes farther removed from the power station. If we were using Edison's DC current as our normal fashion of getting electricity to our homes, we would need power stations every couple of blocks to make sure that everybody got approximately the same amount of power. Um, alternating current doesn't have that same kind of problem. So, um, Back to the PowerPoint slides, we've got another basic unit, which is voltage. Um, if, have you guys taken um, physics 2 yet? Some people have. In physics 2, voltage is assigned um, the, uh, the, the variable of E, and they call it the electromotive force. We don't usually do that. We just call it voltage. Um, it is measured in volts either place um, and named after Alessandro Volta, who invented the first chemical battery, which was called the voltaic pile. Um, and the important thing again here with voltage is that it's defined as a potential between two points. So it's similar to the idea of potential, ener potential mechanical energy. That you know, if you're if you're down here and you're holding some some bottle of pop or whatever, and you're down around my waist, that's that's got a lower potential energy than if I move it up and I'm holding it above my head. The same kind of thing is true that with voltage you have this potential between two points and one point has a higher potential, the other one has a lower potential and that's what defines the voltage. It's not just a thing, it's not something you can kind of capture, but it's a potential between two points. Again, in physics too, it's usually assigned a value of E. Sometimes it's a fancy script E. We're always, almost always going to assign it to a variable called V. When maybe we'll have some subscripts associated with that. A volt is a joule per coulomb. Um, the unit abbreviation, abbreviation is that capital V. For the most part, what we're going to be looking at now um, is going to be most of, uh, most of the voltages will be right in the, the volt range. You won't see a lot of the um, SI prefixes on it. And just like your vectors need a, a magnitude and a direction, your currents need a magnitude and a direction of flow, your voltages need the magnitude of the voltages as well as a polarity, which indicates which of the two points has the higher potential. It's a big deal. You can't just forget that or toss it off in any way. So how do we do that? It's something that you've probably already seen, but um, looking at, again, at the, the document camera, um, again, we don't necessarily care a ton about what's going on in other parts of the circuit, but we can have some, some things hooked up over there, and we can name these terminals A and B just because. And <coughs> um, if it, we, we know that the, the magnitude of the voltage V1 happens to be 2 volts, then we need to know still which one has the higher potential. And in this case, we could say that this is, um, that if A has the higher potential, that's a positive 2 volts. And, you know, that's fine. Um, <coughs> in some textbooks, in some places, and, and Dr. Mork um, over in the EC department really likes using something called double subscript notation to indicate these things. And so if we define, we would, we would, he would say that V1 is a bad name for, for this variable. Let's not call it V1, but call it voltage VAB between the, the points A and B. And we can say very clearly that that's a positive 2 volts. And then we could also say that the voltage between B and A is a negative 2 volts. And it keep, helps you keep those points straight. I'm not going to do this a ton because it's not the way that I happen to learn it, but he really likes it, and if it helps you keep polarities straight and so on, by all means, go ahead and do it. Um, as another quick example, we could have another circuit, you know, cloud of stuff, whatever happens to be over there. Again, we have two points, A and B, and if we were to, we could define them and say, hey, I declare that A is the higher potential, but I get a voltage call it V2, that is negative 5 volts. Well, that just means, again, that I define my polarity wrong, that the polarity, that the potential is actually higher down here at point B than it is at point A. And so, 
Again, this is where the, the double subscript notation can come in handy and say, well, VAB is negative 5 volts, but voltage VBA is a positive 5 volts. Again, it's the same thing, and you could transform this and say, well, if I just re reverse the polarity, say, put the positive uh, pole down there, keep them the same, then the voltage here in, say, V2, V3 is a positive 5 volts. And those two are the same circuit. It doesn't matter. And I suppose the advantage of the double subscript notation is to be very clear that um, if you call A the higher potential, then it's a negative voltage. If you call B the higher potential, then it's a positive voltage. Um, but again, it's important that you indicate that there's both a... Um, a polarity to the voltage as well as the magnitude of the voltage itself. So, um, <clears throat> Okay, um, the next thing that we need to kind of um, to be aware of is the fact that, um, and this is something that ends up being somewhat problematic and, and confusing over the course of the semester, is something that we call the passive sign convention um, that indicates whether a, something is receiving energy or whether it's supplying energy. And <clears throat> um, it's probably best to define, um, well, let's, let's kind of take a look at this first and I'll, I'll throw this at you and then we'll define it more formally later. So we can have a big chunk of a circuit that's just you know, cruising along, it's doing something there's some sort of thing that's attached over here. And we know from hooking up a voltmeter to the circuit that between points A and B, we've defined A to be the positive terminal and B is the negative terminal, that there's a potential of three volts bet between those two points. And so what we'll frequently say is there's a voltage of three volts across this device, across this load, whatever we want to call it. But there's three volts across it. Um, and then <clears throat> if we were to say that there's a current I that's flowing through there and that it's a two amp current, um, <clears throat> this one, because the current is, because the current has entered the low, this element at the positive terminal, we say that it's receiving energy. So this guy is receiving energy. Let me make sure I spell receive right. I before E except after C, right? So this one is receiving energy. Um, and that generally is going to be the case for things like resistors, inductors, and capacitors, that they receive energy from the circuit. Um, but in general, you could also say, well, here's a, a different thing. Call these points C and D. Um, some other load, some other device, whatever it happens to be. We can keep all the polarities the same and say there's three volts here, but that the current is now flowing the opposite direction. Same magnitude, call this one I1, just and I2. Um, so in this one, we're saying that this one is going to supply the energy, and that's because the current, you can look at it one of two ways, and there are equivalent ways. Is the current flowing into the negative terminal, or is it flowing out of the positive terminal? It's the same thing, right? Um, <clears throat> but because it's flowing into the negative terminal, um, then that one is going to be a supplier of energy to the circuit. And that's generally going to be the case. So receivers are going to be things like resistors, capacitors, um, so on, usually. capacitors in certain conditions can act as a supplier of energy. It's important to be aware of that. Suppliers are normally going to be things like voltage sources and current sources. And occasionally things like inductors and capacitors may act as a supplier of energy to the circuit. And we'll, we'll look more at how that can happen. 
So, but again, current flowing into the net, the positive label terminal, that one is going to be receiving energy. If it's flowing into the negative terminal, then that one's supplying energy. Okay. Um, one last basic unit on the, po on the PowerPoint slide. Talk about power. Um, Power is measured in watts, just like it is in um, mechanical energy. It's the same basic idea, um, named after James Watt, who invented the steam engine. Um, in our case, what we are more concerned about, because a watt is determined, defined a whole bunch of different ways. It's a joule per second, uh, it's a newton meter per second, and it's also a volt times an amp, or a volt amp. Um, <clears throat> We won't think about it as being a volt amp for the most part. But, um, but that's how we're going to calculate it. It's a voltage times a current. Um, and that's what it says down at the bottom of the slide. P equals VI. Power is almost always assigned to a variable called P with some sort of appropriate uh, subscript. And you just multiply a current times a voltage, and that gives you a power. Um, it's work done over a period of time, and so it's energy over time. And if you were to really kind of dig down into um, what a volt is and what an amp is, you've got to change potential energy over a certain period of time, and it all kind of comes together in the watt. Um, and that's where it comes from. Now, <clears throat> this is where the passive sign convention really comes into play, that um, as long as you follow the passive sign convention, which can be helped out by the, um, uh, the double subscript notation. If you do this properly, and if you have some good, solid understanding of this, it will help you to understand um, what units are going to be supplying power and what units are going to be absorbing power. Again, for the most part, you're going to see that resistors, capacitors, inductors will be absorbing power and um, the, voltage, the various sources are going to be supplying the power. But um, that relationship of P equals VI, it only holds properly if you follow the passive sign convention. And what that means is that if you define the voltage V, with the positive terminal at the, um, where, where the current is entering. And we've seen that there are examples where it's not entering the positive terminal. So we need to flip the polarity of the voltage, or we need to change the direction of the current. Um, and then, therefore, we go from, say, a positive voltage to a negative voltage, or a positive current to a negative current. And as long as you define it such that the current is always entering the positive terminal of the voltage, and you might need to change one of those two for that to happen. But if you always make sure that the current is going into the positive terminal of the voltage, if you just do a simple mathematical multiplication, including the signs of the, the voltage and the current, you will get an answer that will tell you the, the amount of power that's being absorbed or supplied by the circuit. If you get a positive number, then that power is being absorbed by the element. If you get a negative number, then that uh, power is being supplied by the element to the rest of the circuit. So again, you have to make sure if the, the current is going into the positive node of the, the voltage. And again, you might have to change one of those two values to get it to work exactly the way that you want. So let's look at the last, last example before I set you loose today um, of some circuits with some various um, and, and getting you comfortable with the idea of the passive sign notation. So um, here's a circuit. It's got some stuff that's happening. And we've got um, a, some sort of device hanging out over here. And we've measured and we found that if we define the positive terminal down here at the bottom, that we've got a positive 2 volts across that device, whatever it happens to be. It's some sort of magical black box. Um, and then if we define the current as flowing around in a clockwise manner, and that there are four amps of current flowing around, <clears throat> the first thing to note is that this is not adhering to our passive sign convention. We have lots of positive, you know, we've got a positive current, we've got a positive voltage, but the current, as defined, is flowing into the negative terminal of the voltage. 
So if we want to make sure that we're going to get the right answer and understand whether this device is supplying or receiving power, then we need to switch one of them. And it doesn't matter because we're only going to switch one of them. So let's say that we will change the definition of the voltage. Um, so we will transform the circuit so that what you see is instead of having a positive 2 volts, we're going to change the polarity of the voltage so that you've got positive 2 volts there. We've still got the current flowing around clockwise at 4 amps. And so now, whoops, that should be a negative 2 volts. And that's the important thing about that transformation. We've changed the polarity of the voltage. We changed the sign on the, volt, on the magnitude of the voltage. And so now we can just multiply. P equals V times I. That equals, uh, well, let's keep it straight. 2 volts, negative 2 volts times 4 amps equals negative 8 watts. So, supplying and receiving. Supplying. Negative sign, supplying power. Now, do you need to redraw the circuit? No. As long as you can kind of keep straight in your head that, well, this is flowing into the negative terminal, then one of these needs to be, have the sign changed. You know, that's fine. I, you know, whatever, if it helps you to redraw the circuit, it, not taking shortcuts, then fine. You know, whatever works. Here's another example. I want to do this one as much as anything because for years when I was doing, teaching this class, this um, example was driving me crazy because as far back as the fifth edition of this book, which was the one that's, that I used when I was a student, this one had the wrong answer in it and they finally corrected it in the ninth edition. And it drove me nuts because I'm like, I can get every single one of these problems right except for this example one. It's supposed to be just a trivial example. Why can't I get it right? And they had it wrong in the book. So I felt much better about myself after that day. Um, so, um, yeah, and my notes still re reflect that it's, it's wrong because I, I couldn't figure it out. I'm like, why? This is not right. Because is, it does this circuit, as, as all of the polarities and stuff are defined, does it observe the passive sign convention? Yeah. Current is defined as flowing into the positive terminal of the voltage. So it obeys the passive sign convention by definition. And so we can simply, we don't have to redraw the circuit. We don't have to change any polarities. We don't have to change the direction of the current flow. We don't have to do any of that stuff. We just multiply P equals V times I. And we find that that is a positive 2 volts times a negative 2 amps. And we get a negative 4 watts. So are we supplying or are we absorbing power? We're supplying power because we have a negative sign. Following the, the passive sign convention. Now obviously I wasn't getting the math wrong on this problem. It was pretty, I mean it's kind of hard to screw that up. But the book was constantly saying that you absorb power in this example. And I'm like no. No, you, we're following the passive sign convention. The current is entering the positive node, so we just multiply them together. We get negative 4, so it has to be supplying energy. And they finally updated it. I feel less like a, a real screwball um, because I finally got it right. So um, I think that's as much as we'll try to cover today. Um, so <clears throat> you've got a, a brief overview of um, uh, current of voltage, of current, of power. Um, we'll take a look at how you can start looking at circuits and doing some an analysis on those. Um, make sure that you stop by my office sometime in the next two weeks to say hi and um, check to make sure that you, you know, you're ready to go on with the class. Make sure you learn how to use your calculator to do phasers if you don't already know. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good one.